Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Meki Lozano. I am so excited about today's episode to share it with you guys. Lynn Worthington is joining us on the podcast again, and this topic is so great and so important and also really overlooked. So Lynn and I are speaking about the art of observation and how this is really a deep-rooted attribute of what we do in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Maria Montessori spoke about observation is how we can discover the true nature of the child. And Sophia Cavaletti spoke about how observation is where we begin to see the religious potential of the child. And Rebecca Reutsevich said that observing the child, we can listen deeply to God. So there is a lot about the art of observation that is really vital to what we do in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And so Lynn kind of dissects that for us and helps us understand why and also the how of observation. I hope you enjoy. Lynn, welcome back to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Good afternoon. Lynn, for anybody who didn't hear the first episode you were with us, man, that was like two years ago that you joined me on the podcast. Would you share us who you are and how you got involved with Catechesis of Good Shepherd? Uh, my name's Lynn Worthington, and uh, I uh, well, became involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd when my own children were young uh, at our parish, Immaculate Conception in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, my friend Barbara Pegg, who was also our director of religious education, uh, shared with me religious potential of the child, and I just fell in love with it. And as soon as we were able, uh, in 1991, uh, Barb and I uh, took off to a national course to begin our formation. And uh, from 1991 until 2015, I served as a catechist uh, in both in the parish and at the school at Immaculate Conception. And, uh, and also uh, in that time, I was recognized as a formation leader and began sharing this work with others. In 2015, my husband was ready to retire, and I really was re ready to retire from the parish too. And so <laughs> we uh, we moved uh, to my childhood home of Ball Ground, Georgia, uh, which is about 40 miles north of Atlanta. And now I'm a very happy volunteer. <laughs> uh, That's beautiful. That's great. That is a long time that you've been serving the Good Shepherd. So I am really excited about this topic that we're going to be diving into today about the art of observation. And I'm excited about this because I think that it's a really great tool for our tool bag as catechists, but also parents and grandparents. But also because when we dive into this topic, I feel like it explains some of the essence of who we are in this movement of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Yes, you are. You are right. I I think to to think of observation, and our work is to recognize one of the pillars of our work. Yeah. Without observation, you and I would not be having this conversation. Yeah, it goes all the way back to Maria Montessori and how she talked about being a scientist and observing the children. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. In fact. Uh, in 1946, which was maybe six years before her death, uh, she spoke in London uh, to a group and she said, although this method bears my name, it is not the result of the efforts of a great thinker who's developed his own ideas. My method is founded on the child himself. And she goes on to say, uh, we must proceed not on the basis of our own ideas or our own prejudices, not on preconceived methods, but by observing the child. Uh, she was uh, insistent that uh, everything that uh, pertains to the Montessori method was arrived at uh, via uh, the work of observation. Mm -hmm. And Sophie and Gianna, they both also speak into the power and importance of observation. 
Oh, yes, yes. In fact, uh, after I kind of became obsessed with this topic, I, I began, I haven't ever actually counted to see, but I begin to notice more and more in all of Sophia's writing and Ajana's too, uh, how many times the word we have seen or the word we observed were there. Uh, Sophia, actually, in the, re in the introduction to Religious Potential, she says, our intention is simply to communicate what we have seen up to the present time during a rather lengthy experience with children from very different environments in which the observation of the children has been our principal guide. Uh, such humility in all of these great women, but always uh, pointing to the child, not to themselves. Right. Right. Which is what observation is all about. It's humbling ourselves as the adult, thinking, oh, I have all this knowledge that I want to impart. Yes. Humbling ourselves to just observe the child, where the child's at, what the child's needs are, and what face of God the child seeks today. Yes. Yes. Uh, Gianna actually says that our, our work requires a great discipline. And she said... The discipline is both in preparing ourselves and the environment and through patient observation, that it is a discipline. It is mm -hmm. a, a habit of being that we have to develop. And honestly, I don't really think I understood that particularly well when I was a new catechist. It, it took a while and some uh, assistance along the way for me to, to ra realize that that's where everything came from. Right. I could say the same thing about myself. I don't think I fully understood the power of observation and really the value of it for many, many years as a catechist. I, my own story about this is that uh, when I first began work as a catechist, I had the great gift, the great grace, I might say, from God to be given a uh, uh, help by a Montessori teacher whose name was Betsy Robinson. And Betsy had been a Montessori teacher for years and also had studied at least a little while with Sophia. And she came and offered herself to be my assistant, wow. which was silly because she should be the leader. I was the one that needed, <laughs> I was the one that needed to be guided. Uh, but she was very, she was also, she was just wonderful and helping me with the environment. But after a few weeks had passed and the children had been, you know, taking their lessons and working, things began to get a little rowdy in the atrium. It seemed like all of our work towards peacefulness was falling apart. And I said to Betsy after session, what's happening here? And she said, well, maybe they're trying to tell you something. And I said, well, what? And she said, maybe they just want to work. Mm. And I said, oh, oh, okay. So the next time we got together, she said, look, you just sit over there and watch and I'll help them if they need help. Just see what you see. So I felt really silly to begin with. And I sat down and I'm, I'm watching, but I'm feeling kind of like the useless servant because I'm just sitting there. But I began to notice that uh, the children would come and ask me, we want a lesson, we want a lesson. And I say, no, no, today my work is to watch. And then just a little while, they began to do amazing things, things that I hadn't really noticed that, that they could do. And they didn't really need me to be talking and presenting all the time. Uh, so, you know, she taught me by uh, trial by fire, so to speak, uh, that this work of observation was really a, a, an absolute work. It wasn't just something that I tossed in occasionally. It was something I had to aspire to. Yeah, I can totally relate to what you are saying about how difficult it is because we are such doers as adults. We don't do well with sitting motionless, silently, not correcting the children, not instructing. We desire to feel useful. Yes, yes, we do. And the truth is that that just sitting there probably wouldn't accomplish as much as have an, having a formed vision, uh, knowing mm. what, what something about what we are looking at and what the goals are for the space and the child within the space. And that really uh, makes the observation fruitful and also makes you feel as the observer that you're doing something that's worthwhile. Right. So, Lynn, can you speak into that? As the observer, what are we looking for? Well, 
we're looking for uh, the development of the child. In Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and Montessori, we have many things that are similar, but some things that are also different. And so we might say that the Montessori classroom has, as it's called, the education to life. Mm. It has a very specific uh, model of progress and detailed exercises that nurture the growth of the whole child. In Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, uh, we, uh, Gianna says, we want to prepare an environment which corresponds to the religious needs of the child, a pl- place where they can experience religious life. And so we have really these two different, but very similar, uh, ways of thinking about what what the the space is to offer, and then also the child within the space. And so Dr. Montessori offers us some guidelines for knowing what we are watching for. And first of all, of course, is the planes of development. We must be very conscious of, familiar with uh, those things that are characteristic of the children at their various uh, stages. With the little ones, they, of course, they are guided by the inner teacher. They have an absorbent mind. They have that need for order and language and movement. They want to be independent, and they need to be oriented to reality. They create themselves through repetition. So when we are observing, we are watching to see how those needs are manifested by the child in the environment. With Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, we also are watching uh, and recognizing that the child is drawn to what's most essential. Uh, They have a natural sense of awe and wonder and interest. They are attracted to beauty. They are capable of authentic relationships and of celebration. And they also are able to enter into prolonged periods of silence and contemplation, which uh, leads to prayer. And their prayer comes very naturally. So knowing those characteristics of the children, which have been gleaned over many, many years of observation, we have some uh, clues as to what it is we might see when we are observing children in the environment. We also must keep in mind the sensitive periods. Uh, the sensitive periods are happen within the planes, and they are, are when the child has a strong interest towards a particular skill, like language or writing or a controlled movement. I, I once heard someone talk about the sensitive periods as being like a window thrown open uh, that draws the child to come and explore what can be seen and experienced from that window. So we have to be watching to see where is their focus, uh, what is drawing their attention. Mm-hmm. And by understanding all of these things, it helps us know what we should be seeing and maybe also deviations from those things that we might be seeing so that we can evaluate ourselves and the environment? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There is that. But there is also observation really requires of us a a kind of openness to seeing the new things. Each child is unique. And sometimes those manifestations, while they might be different than what we've seen with other children, it could still be the same work going on in this child. And that openness uh, is also uh, a hard habit to develop. Uh, We have a tendency, of course, to prejudge or to have, you know, high expectations. This is what this is going to be. This is how this is going to be. And children, they don't honor that at all. <laughs> right. They they listen to their inner teacher. They are, they are driven uh, by that plan of God that exists inside of them. Uh, and, and so our openness and our willingness to be surprised, uh, surprised by joy, is uh, a part of the whole process of becoming a good observer. Right. And the child, every day that they come to us, they're a new child. Yes. And so being a good observer means being open to whoever that child is today and the needs they have today. 
And that is so very hard because as adults, we catalog, we, you know, we catalog the last two weeks or the last four weeks of activity and we think, okay, so here he comes, you know, he's, there comes that boy. But in fact, that is really not fair to the child. And it's not really fair to us either Mm. Uh, in order to, to really assist. And, and that is why do we do, why do we do observation? We, why do we even have this environment? Because we want to assist the children in becoming the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so as a catechist or as a parent, this whole art of observation, what does that look like? Well, first, uh, Jonna says we have to put on the mantle of humility. We must uh, become uh, comfortable with the habits of observation and discipline ourselves. And so here are like the points. Uh, We have to learn to to sit silently and motionless. Uh, We have to use what Dr. Montessori termed conscious immobility. We need to envision this environment with ourselves not in it. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. We we really we, we have to almost disappear because a lot of times, even when we don't realize it, our very presence of directing or of uh, responding or of talking with the children uh, keeps them from being their true selves. Yeah. Or maybe even how we're standing over them. Oh, yes. Please don't ever do that. <laughs> uh, I, I, call, I call that the eagle perch. <laughs> and sometimes the eagle eye that goes along with it. <laughs> Can you imagine yourself working in a space with other adults and having someone hanging over you, looking down at your work all the time? I mean, how would you feel? And so that's very definitely something that we have to try to avoid. The other thing that we have to do is we have to inwardly observe ourselves. While we are looking at the children, we also have to recognize how many times do I feel inclined to interrupt them? Mm. And is that interruption necessary? Is it helpful? Uh, It also, we have to think about how many times that we interfere when we see them struggling. Uh, Do we let them make those mistakes that bring them uh, further along on the journey? Or do we always try to step in and protect them from any failure? That's something that we have in our culture uh, sort of ingrained in us is, you know, children need to be, they need to succeed. Well, the pathway to success is strong with, with failure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. we have to imagine that when we are observing, uh, we have to think about our inner impulses and try in that moment to, to help ourselves to, to withhold those impulses. And again, to be open uh, to what the child might figure out without us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We also have to consider uh, about, the environment itself and our place in that environment. Have we been talking too much? Are the materials easy to uh, use? Is there a what we might call a log jam in the environment where, where we are consistently having children that have to come and ask us for help? That shouldn't happen in the atrium, right. really. They should, things, if we've given the lessons well, Uh, then the children should be able to function quite easily without always needing Mm -hmm. our assistance. Or maybe the environment is not prepared well, and that's why they keep needing our assistance for water or a sponge or this material, that material. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we're also kind of looking at in the big picture way is, is the community of children normalized? Are they harmonious and happy? Are they working well together? It's our responsibility, not only to model that, but to make space for it in the room, in the environment. And the final thing that I say you really must do, you really must do, is to record your observations. Dr. Montessori uh, particularly points out how the uh, observations must be objective. Uh, And by recording observations uh, for individual children and for the group, over time, we really can make assessments about the environment, about uh, what the child needs, and we really will know then when to give what to who. Right, 
I love it. I especially love the catechist examination that has to happen. Can you imagine? I'm also thinking how this can help me as a catechist, but also as a mother. If I constantly self-examine how many words am I speaking? How many times did I want to intervene? How many corrections? If I'm assessing that, how much growth I personally would have. Well, and how much more joy you would have with your children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they really will, they really will surprise you uh, when you try to, if you kind of step back and let go a little of control, uh, you will uh-huh. find that they will step up. Yeah, those inner impulses. And they'll let you know when they need you. They will. Yeah. And growing an awareness of those inner impulses. I, I love it. Yeah. Well, I I was reading an article about uh, about parents in particular, and I uh, read something from a child psychologist that really surprised me. He said about ninety nine percent of the adulthood conversations with children are about telling the child what to do and what not to do, mm. about controlling their behavior. <laughs> And while we certainly want to keep our children safe and we want them to know the right way to do things, I think another really helpful thing is just to 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 make time, to carve out time, and it doesn't have to be a lot, but time just simply to be with your child. Uh, you're not teaching them anything. You're not. You're not. You're just letting the child lead you. Oh, you know, in in the play or in the imagination or in the whatever you're doing, letting the child be the leader and you follow just for a little while so that a real conversation can take place. Even with little ones who are not yet conversant, just for you to, to be still and be present is such a gift to the child and to you too. Right. I feel like their little love tanks would be so full if we did that more often. So, Lynn, would you speak into the difference in observation between Montessori classrooms and a CGS atrium? Uh, yes. Yes. I think that it's really important for us to, to, again, to step back to what I said a minute ago about the Montessori classroom has very specifically the goal of education to life. Uh, that is mind, body, and spirit. We have an idea in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, that we want to provide an environment, certainly that serves the whole child, but that particularly is a place for religious life. And so our uh, observations are going to look a little different because we are watching for those things that are part of the religious uh, attitude and, and life of the child. I love, there's an article in one of the journals called Action and Contemplation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sophia speaks of contemplation as an attitude in which the searching moment has been overcome and within which prevails a tranquil look that rests upon the known object. I love that. A tranquil look that rests upon the known object. That known object is a very important uh, comment that she's making because we really must know the children. We must know about children and we must know this child in order to be able to be tranquil before them. But Sophia offers, instead of observation, she offers us as being in con- contemplation of the child and God and their and God's love in the child. Uh, our observation in CGS becomes prayer as we watch this relationship unfold in the child. Yeah, in Rebecca Wurtsevich, she wrote an article in the 2021 journal. The article is called Observation is Prayer. She said, When we observe, we listen deeply to God in the child. So it's almost like the disposition of the observation is different because we are looking for God. Yes. When we are observing the children. Yes. Yes. Well, and I think Rebecca's a person that I should mention here uh, in an article that she has in the new uh, Life in the Vine having to do with the spiral method. 
Yeah. Uh, that is also something that really helps to inform our observations in the atrium. Uh, in this, she speaks about the spiral method as, first of all, searching for the vital nucleus, uh, the points of the Christian message we talk about in our uh, presentations, our meditations with the children, and how the children receive that vital information. And uh, and sometimes they respond in words, and sometimes there's just this deep silence that goes on. Uh, but then they rest in that for a little bit, and then we sometimes hear spontaneously beautiful prayers that come from having confronted that uh, reality, that Christian reality that's proclaimed to them. And then as we watch them work with the materials, even more, uh, we can see that... Uh, the child and God coming together. I, I had a little boy named Paul once, and, and the very first time I built an Annunciation diorama, I painted a window in Mary's house, and I had sort of a nighttime scene in that window. It was pretty simple because I'm not a great painter. But I watched one day as Paul uh, stayed with that material for a very long time all by himself. And then he comes to me and he says, Miss Lynn, I think you have this wrong. <laughs> and I said, well, so how, why do you say that, Paul? What do you think is wrong with it? He says, I am pretty sure the angel came to Mary in the morning, not night. Oh. And I thought, of course, of course, the Annunciation would have to be made as the dawning of a new day. Oh. <laughs> So, so even like you can see in their work sometimes, and sometimes you're just watching how they're moving things, but sometimes we will share with you uh, how their personal work is in fact a, a contemplative work, a work that leads them to prayer. And we're watching for those moments too. And heaven forbid if we let anybody interrupt it. You know, like, <laughs> like that. when we see that happening, that, that uh, attention being drawn, uh, we really want to try to protect a child from interruption. Right. So that's where that observation of knowing when a child is normalized is in that moment that should not be interrupted by observing and taking the time to observe, you know that I should not interrupt the child at this time. Yes. And, and I will say that it is our natural inclination to want to seize the moment. You know, a child is still and they are working and we think, oh, maybe I can take this a little bit further if I talk to him right now. <sighs> No, that's going to be the very moment when we don't want to talk right, to him. Right. It's when he is concentrating. We can make note of that in our observation, that he's shown interest in this, and that we might want to be able to talk to him further about it or open it up further uh, in another moment, but not during that time when the, the concentration, the polarization of attention has grasped him. Right, right. So, Lynn, what about the different levels what about the first plane child versus the second plane child or the level one, two versus three child? How is observation different? Well, in some ways, it's not really different uh, in that we really still have to follow some of the same guidelines uh, of watching and listening and, uh, uh, and recording our observations. But what we're going to be looking for is different. Uh, the older child changes dramatically. And so instead of those sensitive periods that we saw in the first plane, we are now going to see children who are uh, emerging in a, with a very strong interest in social life and, and also awakening to moral consciousness, as well as a huge uh, imaginative explosion of interest in the knowledge of the world. So they, they just have, have different needs and different uh, capacities. And so we are watching to see how they make progress in those different areas. Uh, is there a child that's, I mean, obviously we're going to have a lot more talking, <laughs> a lot more right, conversation right. going on, and we are going to have to uh, watch to see how, what, how we need to model for them 
uh, those grace and courtesy lessons that help to build a peaceful society. They really need a lot of practice and they depend on us for it. But we also have to let them again, make their own mistakes sometimes. Right. Right. Uh, we also, I think with the older children, one thing that is different is that while with the younger children, they really can't tell you about what is happening inside of them at all. Older children now can have some conversation as the uh, absorbent mind becomes the, uh, the mind that's more abstract. They are able to have some conversations with you about what they think is happening, what they what they would like to do, how they would like to plan it. They they can give you some feedback. Uh, we don't want to just you know it's not twenty questions. We don't want to be always asking them too many questions. Right. But they can participate in some uh, ways with your uh, observation of them. We still need to take time to be still and silent. Jana says, observe instead of teach. Mm. On a practical level, how much observation should a catechist aim for within one atrium session? Well, I think I, I was I was told uh, originally that if I had an hour and a half atrium, I should probably be observing for at least 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And now, I, I'll be honest with you. That takes time to build up, mm -hmm. uh, build up a community of children that are working well enough that you really can sit down and say, "No, no more lessons. I'm watching." Uh, you know, right. that's you. You must be able to do that, but it takes some time. Uh, I I would say that sometimes in a truly no normalized community, I might sit for thirty minutes out of that hour. Mm -hmm. and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that builds. Like you said, you're not going to have that in your first atrium session, but maybe halfway through the year, you're able to sit. And I know we've all heard that that's the goal as the catechist is to sit and not be needed. Yes, yes. Uh, to sit and not be needed, but also in that sitting to be contemplative, as Sophia says, watching for those moments of grace, right. but also observing in terms of the Montessori aspect of this, to know how I can help this child. Right. What is it you need, child? I want to tell you that one other story that's so funny. It's about the same, it's about the same little guy, Paul, but it's my favorite observation story. So Paul was in the age when he was four, and towards the end of the year, his older brother was in uh, preparing for First Communion. This was before we had catechesis for older children, so we just had it for the little ones. The, Paul's parents were told that they were to spend some time with, with the older brother making a banner for First Communion Day that would hang on the pew, right? And of course, four-year-old Paul, he wanted to do it too. And his mother decides, rather than to argue, she'll just make it. So she gets out, you know, she gets the things together and she says, now, Paul, what do you want? To, how do you want to decorate your banner? And he looks around at his brothers and he looks at his and he said, well, I think I want a chalice and a paten and a crucifix and maybe a candle on mine. And his mother and father look at each other, you know, they're thinking he's going to want to put ponies or soccer balls or something, you know. And, and so they, the mother says to the father, wow, that Lynn Worthington, she's really doing a good job. She's really doing a good work here. And Paul looks at his mother and says, she doesn't work. She just watches. We do all the work. <laughs> Well, Lynn, is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we finish up today? Uh, yes, two things. Uh, first of all, as catechists, uh, we, we say this in our courses over and over again, but it's really hard to accomplish it sometimes. We really must try to carve out time to go to an Montessori classroom and observe or go to another atrium. It cannot always be in our own environment. Uh, we need that discipline. We need uh, what we can learn from watching somebody else's children. <laughs> so that's one thing I want to say is where I realize it's hard and in some places it seems almost impossible. But even just watching the videos on the Montessori guide, 
uh, montessoriguide.org. They have wonderful videos of Montessori classrooms. Uh, you can watch it, turn the sound off, just see what you see. Mm. Uh, that is, uh, it's really, I think, immensely helpful and really is a part of our formation as much as all the other uh, making materials and preparing the space, uh, reading and studying. That's a part of our formation. And then the, the second thing that I would like to say is uh, that has really to do, uh, I think, with parents. If you don't mind my saying the, something to parents, I, I feel as though in our time in history, parents are uh, sort of overwhelmed with expectations. Mm. And I, I'm sorry to say, I think social media doesn't make this any better. Uh, I mean, nobody's going to put on their Facebook page about the kid that throws temper tantrums at bedtime every day. Nobody's going to put that. But they will put pictures on their Facebook page about how wonderful their family is all the happy times. And that just makes all the rest of the, of the young parents feel, oh, my children are not doing that. Well, I think we have to just back out of that, uh, those high expectations sometimes of a perfect family and instead focus on the miraculous gift that our children are. Uh, interact with them. Try to just be with them. Try to watch them. And also, I think we can imagine how we ourselves feel when someone is always, always telling us what to do and how to do it, when somebody is always critiquing our work. How does that make you feel? Not so good. Uh, we need to back off from that a little too. Right. And uh, while we want limits for our children, I think we need to trust that God has given them what they need if we can just assist that little inner teacher and the Holy Spirit, we can assist by providing a good and loving environment. Uh, we will see wonderful things. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. I really appreciate you joining us on the podcast today to talk about this really, really important and neat subject. It's been my pleasure. I, I hope that it will be uh, an inspiration for some to spend more time uh, in observation. Yes, it definitely has been for me. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. So I really hope you enjoyed the art of observation. And Lynn spoke about how important observation is in this work. And this is actually shown in our very first point of reflection for the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, which says, the child particularly the religious life of the child, is central to the interest and commitment of the catechist of the Good Shepherd. The catechist observes and studies the vital needs of the child and the manifestations of those vital needs according to the developmental stage of the child. This is our very first point, the very first characteristic of who we are in the catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So the art of observation is pretty important. So I have a whole lot of links and resources for you so that you can dive into this even deeper. We have different articles from our journals. So if you are already a member, you get an annual journal from the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And if you're not a member, you can go on cgsusa.org and purchase journals. We also have journals from like the last 40 years. I might be a little off on that number, but about 40 years into the 80s. And some of these articles written by Sophia and Gianna and different beautiful people speak into observation. So I have some links for you on specific articles and in specific journals that you can purchase. Or if you already have the journals, you can look for these specific articles that I've listed in our show notes for you. There's also a couple books that can also aid you in this. So we have this book called Like Leaven by Patricia Coulter. And in chapter nine, she speaks about ways of accompaniment, which goes perfectly with this topic. 
Then we also have the book Taste and See, Savoring the Child's Wisdom, and this is by Pam Moore. And just like Lynn spoke about how important it is to journal our observations, this is what Pam did. And over years and years of her working with children in the atrium, then she turned those observations into a book. And that is what Taste and See is. We actually had Pam on the podcast about two years ago. So I'll put a link to that episode in our show notes as well. In this episode, Lynn also spoke about different Montessori concepts such as normalization and sensitive periods and the planes of development. And so I am going to add to our show notes links to episodes that specifically talk about each of those topics in case you don't remember what planes of development means or sensitive periods or normalization. We have podcast episodes that specifically talk about each of those things and why they are so important and also why they are important to the religious education of children. And so if you want to go back and listen to those or you haven't yet listened to them, I have them right there for easy access. I'm also putting in our show notes the episode that Lynn did with us. She spoke with us about chapter three of The Good Shepherd and the Child, The Joyful Journey on practical suggestions. So this was way back episode 17. So I have a link to that in our show notes as well. So lots and lots of really great things. I also have a few Montessori websites that I'm linking you to. Lynn spoke about the Montessori Guide website. And then there's also an article in Montessori Print Shop that I linked for you. And on that article, they have an eight-minute video about observation. That is so good. So I highly recommend that. So go to our show notes. Lots of great things for you there. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member and support this work and get all the beautiful benefits of being a member, go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.